a couple months ago, I was reading through Luke 24. Remember that, Luke 24. And I was in preparation for this particular series about the resurrection. What I noticed as I was studying through Luke 24 was that there were several groups of different people represented, all having to do with the resurrection morning. And so I found myself wondering, why did Luke record all these different scenarios and different situations with people who are experiencing the resurrection? And as I began to press in and study, I realized that, at least to me, it seemed as if Luke was dealing with different groups of people who were dealing with different situations in life. Last week, we looked at the first group of women uh, who appeared at the resurrection, and they, they all had a very on-fire faith for God, but their faith was dampened by the resurrection. And so for them, they're coming to the tomb, and they're bringing their spices uh, to, uh, for the body that had been buried, and the encounter of the resurrection renewed their faith. Each one of these groups of people represents, I believe, a different group of people and a different situation that God wants to speak into. Last week, with the group of women being the first ones at the tomb, it seemed as if God wanted their faith renewed. This morning, if you're one of those people who have ever screwed up big time, uh, and I would happen to fall into that category, and I'm sure most of you have, you can look back and see times when you've really screwed up big time, really blown it. I'd like for you to lean in this morning. Lean in really close and listen, because there's another group of people that were represented at the resurrection morning, and this group of people would have fallen into that category. The category that I've fallen into, the category that many of you have fallen into, where you have blown it big time. What we're going to see this morning as we work through Luke 24 is that broken relationships need restored. And I've entitled this series 24, uh, One Day in Big Impact, or 24 and What a Difference a Day Will Make, because really what God seems to be doing is special things in these different groups of people. The women's hearts are restored. In the story today, the group of people had blown it big and they needed their relationships reconciled. They needed their relationships restored. Maybe you can identify with that part. Maybe even this past week, you have found yourself blowing it really big. Maybe being more anxious than you needed to be. Or maybe being short-tempered or angry. All of us, after we blow it real big in our walk with the Lord, we just feel that. We, we feel like we've grieved the Holy Spirit. We haven't been obedient. Well, this particular group of people, the resurrection would have been incredibly important because they had a broken relationship through the way they responded to the death of Jesus on the cross. I want to begin again in Luke 24. It says this, that on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. And I, guys, can you hear the ring? There's a little bit of a ring. I don't know if you hear it, but I can hear a ring. We can. All right, so the first day of the week, Very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. I want to remind us here that the women is plural, right? John's use of this is Mary Magdalene went to uh, the tomb. That's John's story, and he's telling it because he has something very specific John wants to communicate. As Luke's working through this story, there's multiple women And so I want us to keep this in mind. Very early in the morning, the women took the spices. And remember, I mentioned last week, you take the spices because you're anticipating a a dead body. So they're all heading to the tomb, anticipating a dead body. It says they found the stone rolled away. They, being multiple women, found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So here's all these women going to the tomb. To anoint Jesus' body, they find the stone rolled away, find an empty tomb. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleam like lightning stood beside them. Some of your translations will say two angels. 
In their fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, or the angel said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. And then these angels share something fascinating with these women. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and the third day be raised again? And for these women, it was probably like a V8 moment, like, oh, yeah, now I remember. This had to happen. Jesus told us this was going to happen. It says they remembered his words. Then they remembered his words. Well, here's what they do. They came back, it says in verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they, these women, told all these things to the eleven. Now, I want you to think with me, um, there, and it says not only to the eleven and to the others. I want you to think with me for a minute. What are all the things that the woman, women would have been telling these 11 and the others who are with them? Uh, I'll tell you in a moment, but I want you to think with me about this. They probably set a time, say, say 5.45 a.m. They said, hey, let's meet over by the olive tree just outside of the garden. And so wherever it was, these women would have gathered. On the way there, they were curious. How are they going to be able to take their spices into the tomb because there was a stone and there were guards. When they get there, they find that the stone has been rolled away. They get there and they look in and the body's not there. They just find linen. And then they're visited by these angelic beings. And then on top of that, they hear from these angelic beings a reminder that Jesus told them in Galilee that the Son of Man is going to be handed over to sinners and he's going to be crucified, but he's going to be raised again the third day. All these things from the journey all the way to the tomb and everything that happened, they come back and it says they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. And then Luke records that it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others, and there were other women there, we believe, and, and they who told this to the apostles. So they told all these things, stone rolled away, empty tomb, no body of Jesus, just linen, two angels, The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of angels, be crucified, third day be raised again. So you probably thought of some of those things when I said, what are all those things? But now I want you to think with me again. If you were one of the 11, and you have these multiple women witnesses coming back to you, and are sharing with you all these things, Stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. There was only linen. Two angelic beings showed up. They told us and they reminded us of what Jesus had told us. And if all these women witnesses come to you and you're part of the 11, what or maybe how would you expect them to respond? What would you think would be running through their mind? For me, when I was thinking about this, I'm just anticipating 11 guys jumping up and down and celebrating, yes, 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 like high-fiving in the room. Amen. Um, Thank you, Lord. Uh, Yay, God. Like, however you could celebrate it, I'm imagining these 11 guys just jumping to their feet in elation celebrating yes and that's not what happened not what happened it's fascinating what luke does first part of luke chapter 24 with the account of the women we watch their faith be renewed and in this part of luke we see the need for faith to be restored I I wonder, 
I wonder if these 11 found themselves being resistant to the reconciliation because of disappointment, because of pain and hurt, unmet expectation with the Lord and with themselves. It doesn't seem, here's why I say that, it doesn't seem like that far of a stretch to believe multiple women witnesses coming back to you and sharing with you all that they've seen. But I put it this way, that sometimes we are afforded an opportunity to experience incredible reconciliation, but rather than take the risk, we dismiss the possibility. Think about this. God is providing an opportunity for these guys to experience incredible reconciliation rather than take a risk and believe they dismiss the possibility. These guys have been on an incredible emotional roller coaster. This news they're hearing from the women was mind-boggling. It was just a few days earlier when they watched their friend, their hero, the healer, the deliverer, the miracle worker, and the one who called himself their friend be nailed to a cross. I wonder if when the women came and gave all the news and told them everything, I wonder if there was something even on a subconscious level we don't know. I, I don't know. I'm just going, I'm thinking through this, and I'm going, I'm wondering if these guys are being reminded that they slept in Jesus' greatest hour of need. That when the Roman band of soldiers showed up, it says that they all fled. I wonder if Pete is reminding, being reminded in his, in his head of the encounters at the temple where he denied the Lord three times. Here's what happens to us. Our flesh desires to protect ourselves from disappointment, from incredible pain. Our pride will get in the way, and we resist reconciliation. Sometimes we're afforded an opportunity to experience incredible reconciliation with someone where there's been major disappointment, deep wounds. Let me go back. I want to read that again. I want to make sure we don't lose this. Sometimes we are afforded an opportunity to experience incredible reconciliation with someone where there has been major disappointment, deep wounds, and indescribable pain. Some of you have been through that. But rather than take the risk of experiencing healing, and reconciliation, and the sweetness of a restored relationship, we automatically dismiss the possibility. All of us do this more often than we realize. Think about this. Couples do this, and often to the demise of the relationship. They've gone through a painful experience with a partner. They're given an opportunity for reconciliation, but rather than do it, they quickly dismiss it, rather than go through that possible pain and disappointment again. Singles do this. Singles will date someone. They'll go through a painful experience that oftentimes will paralyze them from taking another risk and having reconciliation and restoration and having another relationship. Siblings do this and choose to live distant for decades, so oftentimes over silliness. Parents do this and remain estranged from their own children. Children do this and remain distant from their parents. Friends do this and miss out on how they could sharpen one another to become more like Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ do this at the expense of much-needed spiritual growth and the incredible opportunity to be a witness. We resist the opportunity to encounter and experience restoration, we quickly dismiss the possibilities. And many times we do it because our old DNA just simply resists reconciliation. On top of that, 
we have Satan who lives to divide. Satan is living to divide. So he's not, it's not like he's encouraging us in the, pro, in the process when opportunities come about for restoration. He's not the guy who's going to be beside us going, hey, take the step, take the step, this will be good. No, he's filling our minds and our hearts with, oh, that Jesus, he told you he was your healer, he was the miracle worker, he was all this, he, he showed you all that stuff, he was going to be your friend. And look how he left you hang out to dry. Satan lives to divide. He fills our minds with things that simply are lies. In fact, the scriptures call him the father of lies. He feeds into the disappointment. How could you ever have a relationship with the Lord again? You fled from him. You denied him. In his greatest hour, you didn't show up for him. Satan lives to divide. I say it's still water fairly regularly, regularly that Satan does his best work within a local church. And the reason I believe that to be true is because if he can separate you from the local church, the local church is God's design to take the gospel and the hope of Jesus to the rest of the world. That's God's design. Not independents, not mavericks, not isolated believers doing it on their own, but the body of Christ functioning as one. And so it makes sense that Satan does his best work with inside the walls of the local church or inside the body of a local church. Many of you are outside a local church because you've been hurt. And broken relationships need restored. These guys' relationships certainly has been broken. I put one of, the, one of God's greatest desires is to bring about reconciliation, to restore relationships that have been broken. Of all the things that God desires, this is at the top of the list. 2 Peter 3 9. It's not that the Lord is slow and slack in his promises, but the, it's the will of the Lord that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God desires reconciliation of broken relationships. This is at the core of the gospel. The gospel is about restoring broken relationships. God so loved the broken world that he sent his one and only son to die on a cross so that whoever might believe on him wouldn't be separated from him and, and wouldn't perish but have eternal life. God's greatest desire is to bring about reconciliation, to restore relationships that have been broken. But our flesh always resists the restoration. Um, it's interesting it seems that this encounter we're reading in Luke is the first time the disciples would consist of 11. So when we read this, that the women came and told all that, they, all that they had seen and everything that they had encountered, they're telling it to the 11. The fact that there only is 11 ought to automatically clue into these guys just how broken we are and how in need of restoration we are. All of us, we can identify that one of the 12 who walked with Jesus for three years and watched all the incredible miracles that Jesus did, betrayed him. That ought to be enough to clue us in that we need restoration and reconciliation. Yet that's not the case. I want to pick back up Luke 9. Get us back into our text where we are. It says, when they came back from the tomb, speaking of all these women, they told all the things to the eleven and to the others. And then Luke recounts who those women are. But this is their response. Verse 11, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Are you kidding me? They did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. They just came back, multiple witnesses, all these women, sharing with them all the things that they have just encountered. Stone rolled away, that was a miracle. The empty tomb's a miracle. The fact that the linen's there and there's no body of Jesus is an absolute miracle. The fact that the two angels show up's another miracle. The fact that the, the angels remind them of something Jesus told them when he was in Galilee and that they knew that, 
that Jesus was going to be handed over to sinners and be crucified, but raised a third day was a miracle. The fact that they could remember when Jesus told them that, and they all go back and they share, you'd think the 11 would be jumping up and down elated. Instead, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Do you see it? Do you see how our flesh always chooses to resist reconciliation? Some of it's the pain and hurt and disappointment from people who've done things to us. Some of it's the pain and disappointment of things we've done. Some of it's just our pride. The fact that it says they did not believe the women, I I go, that is absolutely, that's lame. You could argue in their culture, and some use that, this little truth, uh, in this particular passage, and they go, well, you know, the women didn't have any, any cred. They had no credibility in this day. They were not looked to as people who were just believable in general in the culture. They were looked down upon. They were despised. You can say all you want. I say that's lame. Don't let the disciples off the hook by saying it's women. That's just lame. We're like this. We resist. All of us do this. Um, You could say, well, their words seem nonsensical. That's lame. That is lame too. And here's why it's lame. Think about it. Is it that nonsensical? These guys have just spent three years tracking with an unbelievable miracle worker who gave sight to blind people, helped deaf people, and mute people, and paralyzed people, and lepers. They they saw him calm the winds and the waves. They watched him feed thousands and thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. And they got to pick over up the 12 baskets of leftovers. Does it seem that nonsensical? Add this to the equation. On top of all the other miracles that they witnessed in and were with Jesus when they happened, they watched Jesus raise people from the dead. And it wasn't that long ago that Jesus' good friend Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus with the disciples present, and he was in the tomb four days. So does it seem that nonsensical? I don't think so. I think that's lame. I think what it is is that we resist reconciliation. when we And we're broken people. And this is very, very true when we screw up big time. Because when we screw up big time as a follower of Jesus, we've already experienced the goodness of the Lord. And we're like, he was so good to us, and we didn't deserve it. And what did we do? We went and we tanked it. We blew it. We screwed it up. And and that sense inside of us causes us to resist his gracious reconciliation. No, I still love you. No, I still want to use you. I still want you to be a part of my mission. We can't hardly even begin to fathom that kind of love and that goodness. So when it's offered, when it's possibly presented to us, we just quickly dismiss it. And we all do this. It's so unfortunate we do this with our spouses. Singles do it in relationships, and siblings do it with one another, and parents do it with their kids, and kids do it with their parents. And inside the local church where we're designed to rub and almost irritate one another onto love and good deeds. We do that. Broken relationships need restored, and they needed their relationships with the one that they had invested their life in restored. And when they had all the news, it was so believable. With multiple women witnesses all sharing the same thing and plenty of plenty of believable truths, they write it off as nonsense. It highlights for us a tendency that we all have, which is to resist reconciliation. It highlights our brokenness. 
We would hardly expect, we would hardly expect that the 11 would be, would be among those who would be first to deny a resurrected. I wouldn't expect that. You wouldn't expect that. Unless we took time to self-examine, to consider our own journeys with God, how quick we are after we've blown it to pull back and to resist reconciliation, not just with God, but with other people because we don't want to step back in and take the risk of being disappointed again or experience pain, or our own pride gets in the way. But we resist the reconciliation, for sure. It does say, and Luke gets to this point, after he says that they believed it to be nonsensical, he writes in verse 12, Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Right, question here, question for you. Did you get the sense when I read that that in Peter's heart there was like this huge sense of relief, the weight was coming off his shoulders, this renewed sense of joy, this sense of elation in his spirit? Let me read it again. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Do you get that sense? I don't think so. I don't get that sense. And I don't think that's what Luke's recording it. I don't think that's why he's writing. I don't believe that's as the author's intent. You might wonder, why did he just, why did Luke only include Pete? Because when John gives this encounter, John tells it a different way. That, that Peter and John both went. And John was actually a little faster. He took track in Jerusalem, so he was a little quicker. He's going to get to the tomb first. And he's going to stand by the edge of the tomb. Peter's going to go in and see the empty linen. And we read here in Luke, walks away wondering what happened. In John's account, John eventually goes in, it says he saw and he believed. So why is Luke only highlighting Peter? He leaves out the story of John, and I know he was aware of it because he, Luke was a physician and incredibly detailed. Why would he leave it out? And why would he only include Peter? Well, I think from Luke's perspective, he's using Pete as a representative, perhaps, of all the 11. Think about this. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when you have the list of disciples, Pete's always first. Pete was the first one that Jesus went to on the boat, and that's recorded in Luke chapter uh, 5, that encounter. And so Luke is well aware and I wonder if there's another aspect to this. Luke is writing to a guy whose name's Theophilus. And Theophilus was a Greek, uh, probably a leader. And this Theophilus guy is representing a whole bunch of Greek people who are outside of faith, who desperately need God. I wonder if Luke is showing that even those who seem to be really, really strong in faith have a hard time believing which would really be helpful for these Greek people who have had small g gods their whole life and idols their whole life, getting a picture that, yeah, it's really hard to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Even those who walked closest to him when they were disappointed had a hard time believing. It seems to me that this might be part of why Luke is including this story. Pete struggled. It makes sense that I will struggle. In the end, I should still believe because Jesus is clearly the Messiah and the Savior of the world. What a great message for the Greek culture and those who are struggling to walk away from their idolatry and all their small g gods that they have established. Holding forth a man like Peter and who has clearly been a leader and a representative for all the disciples and now struggling to believe and yet 
Luke's going to hold forth over and over that Jesus clearly is the Messiah. Pete had a lot of special encounters. Jesus came to him in the boat first, and uh, you may remember there that Pete basically falls and just goes, man, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm not even worthy to be with you. And Jesus, yeah, I'm going to turn you into a fisher of men. Uh, Luke records the account where it's asked, who, who do people say I am? Some say you're Elijah and John the Baptist. Who do you say? And Luke records this, that Pete's response is, oh, you're the Messiah. You're the Messiah. Luke also records, he records for us those difficult moments that Peter encountered, the struggle moments. Uh, let, me read, let me read one of those for you. Mark 14. Mark 14, we read uh, about one of those low moments for, for, for Peter. This is Jesus right after the Last Supper. He, he says to his disciples, you will all fall away. Uh, it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead in, of you into Galilee. And Pete says, even if all fall away, I will not. But truly, I tell you, Jesus says, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Pete insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And then it says, and all the others said the same thing. Peter was the one who was out front being very vocal, right? But he also, Luke records this about Pete. After Jesus had been arrested, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Pete warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus, she said. He denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went away out into the entryway. And when the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is the one of them. He denied it. A little while, after a little while, those standing near said to Pete, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And he began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately, just as Jesus said would happen, immediately the rooster crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Well, it's also recorded for us that these guys, when Jesus was arrested, all fled from him, all of them. P Peter, no doubt, is struggling to accept the reconciliation because he's blown it so big. I have done that, and I have struggled personally to accept the gracious, loving gift of forgiveness and reconciliation that the Lord has granted to me. It's just, honestly, it's mind-boggling. It's hard to fathom that God can and would and desires to do that. That's what the resurrection does. The resurrection enables broken relationships to be restored. Uh, Luke, it's interesting. He's recounting these stories at the resurrection. But when, when he leaves this part of the story, you just get the sense that Pete still doesn't believe. And I, I wonder if you're there. I wonder if you go, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I was so hurt in the local church. I don't know. Can you not see that God desires you to be plugged in his body, doing his work? That the local church is something that he made for his purposes? Do you not see Satan's ha just crafty hand seeking to divide? He lives to divide. Do you not see it in your own family with your siblings? Do you see it with parents between your children and children with your parents and you among friends? How our flesh resists? restoration, but the resurrection 
made it possible. We're not going to get into it today. We'll pick it up here next week. But something fascinating happens. Peter, at this stage, doesn't see the risen Christ. And he's still struggling to believe. Even after all these witnesses. Next week we'll pick it up, but Jesus is going to walk into room later in the evening of this day, the resurrection day. He's going to walk into some space, and oh my goodness, there he is. And they're still, get this, they're still struggling to believe. He says, look at my hand. Look at my feet. This is how hard it is for us to believe when we've been hurt or somebody's hurt us, or we, we've disappointed ourselves. One of the disciples wasn't there. His name was Thomas. John chapter 20, this is recorded. All the, so, so the women would have told Thomas. Now all the disciples who see Jesus that evening would have told Thomas, and he says, I'm still not going to believe, not until I see it myself. That's how resistant we are. That's how hard it is for us to believe. But I want to encourage you this morning that it's through the resurrection that broken relationships can be restored. That's where the power comes from. That's where the victory comes from. And the Holy Spirit is able to come into us because Christ conquered Satan and death, sin and hell. And so what I want to do is I want to leave you with the fact that God didn't only want to just restore a relationship with Peter where they became friends again. He wanted to use him. And you can read this encounter. It's just an unbelievable story. At the end of John, Jesus shows up, and at this point, Peter had seen Jesus several times, but he still couldn't believe that he was worthy to be a disciple and used of the Lord. And he's taking the crew out fishing again, and they're not having very much success. And Jesus goes back to how he began with Pete in a boat, telling him to throw it on the other side. He says, hey, Pete, throw it on the other side. I don't think he used his name, just throw it on the other side. They threw it on the other side after fishing all night. Same thing that happened when it began for Pete, it happened again. They drew in such a large number of fish. I think it was 153. And then John says, that's the Lord. And Man, Peter sheds its garments, and he dives in the water, and he goes running to Jesus. Now his faith has been restored, and Jesus wants to take it one step further. Yes, I know you know now that I'm here and I'm resurrected, but I still want to use you. And so he takes it a step further with Pete, and he takes him aside, and he asks him, do you love me? And he asks him this three times, and the third time, it really... It really dinged Peter in his spirit because he was reminded so freshly of when he denied Christ three times. But the Lord allowed him to go through that, to have healing and restoration, to have reconciliation. And he wants that for you. He so desperately wants it. He loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die on a cross so that your relationship with him could be reconciled. So I have the three takeaways. Where do we go from here? First of all, if you happen to be viewing this message today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, do you recognize that your DNA, your flesh, is resistant? Maybe you see now that you have a broken relationship with God and with a lot of other people and you resist restoration and reconciliation. You can see maybe more clearly than ever that it's your pride. I would ask you to humble yourself, to confess to the Lord, to acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Invite Jesus to come into your life today. Ask him for forgiveness and invite him to come into your life, and he will, and your life will begin to be different. Second of all, if you've trusted in Jesus, but you've screwed up big time, um, maybe you had an affair, maybe you lied to someone, cheated, uh, cheated on your taxes. Maybe who knows what you did, but you know in your spirit what it is. You know you screwed up big time. Would you just confess that? First John one nine says if we confess, just confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just confess it today, and fresh start. 
and know that God doesn't just want to restore the relationship. He still wants to use you to advance his cause. Third, I would just ask you that if there's somebody that you know, there's distance in a relationship, the relationship's been broken, and God is pressing upon your heart to pursue reconciliation and restoration, he's given you the power through the resurrection and through the presence of the Holy Spirit to begin to take some next steps. I get this. I get this. That there may be people on the other side of the relationship that are still going to be resistant, still want no part of it. You're not responsible for their part. You are simply responsible for your part. How will you handle your part? Broken relationships need restoration. We resist reconciliation and restoration. But through the power of the resurrection, relationships can be restored. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for truth. We thank you for the word of God. Thank you for an author like Luke, a physician, a guy who wrote down in an orderly sequence with incredible detail for a guy named Theophilus that all of us could glean truth from. And I pray, Lord, that we would not be hearers only, but that we would be doers, that we would respond to your word, that we would respond to truth. I pray that if there's somebody listening who doesn't know you, that they would trust you today as their Lord and Savior. If there's somebody who's been a follower of you and has blown it and screwed up big time, I pray that they might confess it today and start fresh. And Lord, if there are relationships that have been broken and you desire that somebody listening pursue reconciliation with whoever it is, regardless of how they respond, Give them grace, give them wisdom, and give them the power of your Holy Spirit to know how to uh, move towards that reconciliation. Give them patience, give them uh, wisdom, give them realistic expectations, and trusting in you in all things. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name.